This is David Prosper, host of The Leadership Revolution. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast from Public House Media. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Food for Thought podcast. I am your host, Kylie Thompson. Thanks so much for tuning in to episode number two. I am thrilled to be sitting down with Miss Corridor 2020, Madison Augie. And just to give you guys a little bit of a heads up, this episode was pre-recorded in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what that means is that we could not conduct our interview in person and it had to be over Skype. And with that comes a lot of hurdles and a lot of things that I have never done before, which includes working from my living room with a roommate and a one-year-old puppy. So if you hear a little bit of barking, I tried to have Millie keep it down as much as possible, but she's just a baby. And there was some barking, some toy squeaking and stuff like that. But what Madison was saying was so important. I didn't want to interrupt her and it wasn't really bothering her and I, so hopefully it doesn't bother you guys. But with that being said, I talked to Madison all about her time as Miss Corridor, her social impact initiative, which is called the Blossom Revolution, which is so amazing. And she has a Girl Scout patch. She's doing some really boss babe things. It was exciting to get to talk to her about all of that. And it was really refreshing to talk to somebody who is involved in pageants and has a similar social impact initiative as me and has that same passion and drive for spreading awareness and advocating for people that have eating disorders. So I had so much fun with Madison conducting this interview, and I hope you all have just as much fun listening. Thank you so much. Enjoy this episode. Madison, why don't you just tell me a little bit about yourself, anything that you want to include? Well, um, so as Kylie mentioned, my name is Madison. I am currently serving as Miss Corridor 2020 in the Miss America organization. I live in Iowa. Um, I live in Iowa City. Go Hawks. Uh, I currently work as a patient transplant navigator at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. I graduated with degrees in biology and psychology. Is this like along the lines of what you want? Yeah, no, you're doing great. You're doing great. And um, I am here. I'm so excited to be on the Food for Thought podcast because A, I love the name and B, this is a a cause of something obviously so close to my heart as well as Kylie's. Um, And I'm here to talk about a little bit about my journey and the Blossom Revolution, which is my social impact initiative. Awesome. And we're so excited to have you. Um, I shared this with you on Instagram, but like as soon as I was thinking about guests that I wanted to have on the podcast, I was like, Madison, got to get her on (laughs) ASAP. So I'm so glad that you were able to come on early on in the podcast with me. And as things progress, I might have you on again, just because I don't know anything about podcasting at this point. And I'm going in feet first. And so if I need to make a better episode later with you, then that'll definitely have to happen to you. Um, but why don't you just tell me, let's just dive in and you talk a little bit about like your eating disorder journey. Yeah. Um, so as I was kind of reflecting on this and I'm sure as you're very aware, you have to kind of make yourself a story to tell an interview Mm -hmm. to market yourself. And so as I was thinking about my story, I have had some trait of an eating disorder probably throughout my entire life. I am, well, I am, I was when I was younger as well, um, really perfectionistic, very anxious, very type A. Um, And one story that I always think back on was I was about probably eight years old and I was getting ready for school. My mom was getting my brothers and I ready. And I think it was picture day. And I had a scrunchie that I really, really wanted to wear. I had, like, just gotten it at Claire's. It was white. It had rhinestones on it. I wanted to wear it so bad. And I couldn't find it anywhere. And so I, like, completely imploded and started crying because I was like, I don't deserve nice things. I don't deserve good things. And I was eight crying about a scrunchie. So if that leads anything to how I treated my body, if Mm -hmm. that's the way that I reacted to losing a scrunchie, um... It was, I've been really sensitive and really susceptible to bullying my entire life. Um, One other kind of formative moment was I was diagnosed with scoliosis when I was 13 years old. And for people who don't know what scoliosis is, 
um, my spine is curved. And so instead of being a straight line, mine is shaped like an S. And when I found that out, I was already having a good deal of body image issues and wondering why my body doesn't look like everybody else's. Why am I so different? So while it was really nice to be like, oh, this is why, it led to a lot of stuff down the road. I had to have a big clunky plastic brace. And I wore that um, through the end of middle school to the beginning of high school, which I don't need to tell anybody. It's a super, super hard time to be a girl just in general. Yeah. Um, And um, thinking back on that time, I just really hated my body because of the way that the brace made me feel. It had holes in the, uh, the very front of it where the straps would hook. And I remember if I ate too much, my skin would come out of there. And I remember just like viscerally hating that, feeling like I was fat, feeling like I was ugly, that I didn't deserve that. So I would make sure that I didn't eat enough that my stomach would push out of those. Um, and so that kind of reflecting back, those are, I think, some big moments where I was like, oh, I've had an eating disorder or body dysmorphia for a long time. And I just never really had the words to put to it because the things that I were doing didn't seem drastic at the time. And because I didn't ever lose a a large amount of weight or I didn't ever gain a large amount of weight, it it never really flagged people as being problematic. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the number one thing that people think of when they think of eating disorders is like, you have to lose like X amount of pounds or you have to weigh this much. But like, it's, it's almost comforting for me to know there's somebody else out there that didn't have that happen because I did lose some weight. And then, I mean, there were times where I gained weight too, but I think what people need to understand with eating disorders is like, it's how you feel and how you, how you perceive yourself. And so that's almost comforting for me to know that there was somebody else out there that like, I feel like for me, it was like, I'm trying to figure out how to put it into words, but I was like, well, at the time I was really sick. I was like, well, I haven't lost you know, this many pounds. So I'm not sick. I don't need to worry about that. Did you ever have those moments too? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I, again, for so long, I didn't realize that what I was doing to my body was wrong. Um, Mm -hmm. And there was one quote that while I was going through counseling really, really stuck with me is that eating disorders are not a physical disorder. They're a mental illness. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense for a mental illness to be shown physically you know? So it's just the fact of saying, okay, I can still struggle with this. I can still struggle with my body and disordered eating, even if I don't look like what an anorexic should look like, even though if I don't fit the picture of what bulimia should be like, I, it's really hard to like validate your struggles when nobody believes kind of what you're saying and what you're going through, because you don't fit the picture of what people think an eating disorder, quote unquote, should look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I know that you, I mean, you just said that you went through like therapy. Um, that was actually my next question. It's like, what were, if there were any like formal recovery processes, did you go through or what steps did you take and kind of what age did that start happening for you too? Yeah. Um, so I never went to like a formal outpatient or inpatient, um, unit. I, Mm -hmm. um, was really, really fortunate that I had some really amazing, um, resources when I went to school. I started going to counseling when I was a sophomore in college and really for a completely, not completely unrelated, but not specifically for eating disorders. I had a panic attack my sophomore year. Um, I was not taking care of myself. I was in and out of a really, really negative, toxic relationship. Um, And when I was, quote unquote, taking care of myself, I wasn't eating enough and I was working out and being like, well, why isn't this working? Why don't I feel better? Um, So I had a panic attack and I went to the counselor's office. And I started a counseling appointment and pretty early on the counselor was phenomenal. She, I think, understood like, oh, you have some really, really interesting beliefs about food. You have some really interesting behaviors about food. Have you ever thought that maybe this could be an issue for you? And for me, that was all that I had ever known. I grew up in a house where it was dieting. Um, I grew up, you know, in the media, obviously, when you're trying mm-hmm. to fit these standards of beauty. For me, I always had the number 120 in my head, that that's what, like, a female should weigh. Mm-hmm. Even that though... That's actually my number two. That's yeah. I feel like it's it's such a, a number that's in, just embedded in our culture. Mm-hmm. And I don't... It, it's so strange and it's so ubiquitous that I could not tell you where that number comes from. 
I could not tell you why that was the number, but I was like, oh, if I get down to 120, like, then I'm good, then I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And um, as soon as I started opening up about these things and opening up about how I was treating my body and what I was eating and how I was exercising, I think the counselor kind of red flagged that. And she was like, I think that we need to work on something else. This will probably help your anxiety if we break down some of those beliefs, if we break down some of those barriers and talk about why you feel that you have to be this certain size or look this certain way. Mm -hmm. And were there in your, like in therapy or, you know, just out on your own doing your own work on yourself, were there any like pivotal moments for you when you were like, oh my gosh, I am sick. I do have an eating disorder. I think that I'm still having those moments to this day when I think back about how I used to, to treat myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if there was one like aha moment. I think it was more like a gradual process. And I'm sure you can attest to this as well. And you kind of like start dipping your foot into the water. You're like, mm, okay, I can understand like maybe that isn't super healthy. Mm -hmm. And then kind of like, okay, maybe I understand that like I don't need to eat just lettuce for an entire day. Like, okay, right. <laughs> maybe, maybe I do feel better when I eat food that nourishes me. And maybe I feel better not going to the gym. So for me, it was a much more gradual process of just accepting that, okay, this was my mindset. Let's change that a little bit at a time. And now I feel like I'm in a really good place where it's like, oh, okay, I can look back and say, this is what I used to believe. And this is what I used to think, but here's why that's harmful now. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then, um, so I know it, obviously that you're involved in the Miss America organization. Do you just want to tell me a little bit about how maybe being involved in pageant specifically has affected your eating disorder recovery, if it has at all? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I had a really, really good friend who was part of the Miss America organization, and I saw her go through it, and I was like, wow, I really want to do that. And mm -hmm. this, mind you, was in a time that I thought that I was recovered. So this was about my senior year of uh, college. I had been in counseling for about a year and a half, and I was like, okay, I feel like I'm in a good place. Um, so I was getting ready to compete for a local in 2016 okay. and that was still when they had lifestyle and fitness. I was showing my roommates all of my wardrobe and I had like just got my swimsuit in. I put my swimsuit on and like that was just one of the most horrifying moments for me was just seeing my body in that swimsuit. I hated it. I called my mom crying telling her how awful I looked that I couldn't believe that I even thought that I would step on stage looking like that. And that kind of set me into a really, really bad downward spiral. Obviously I, I got back into counseling. Um, I dropped out of the pageant and I kind of resigned myself to being like, okay, this dream is tucked away. It was nice while I had the idea for it, but I don't think that's for me anymore. I can't put myself in that negative situation. Mm -hmm. And do you, so you did compete in Miss America 1.0. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you feel, I guess for the listeners that might not be pageant patties like us, um, <laughs> Miss America is currently going through changes. Um, one of those changes being that they got rid of swimsuit and they've, tra they've turned it into more of a competition focusing on what you say and how you say it, not necessarily how you look. Um, it's not considered a beauty pageant anymore. Um, so getting rid of swimsuit was a big part of that. And I guess for you, how did it feel competing in swimsuit? Did you, did those negative feelings follow you through your competition or? Oh, absolutely. So I remember reading the article that they're like, Miss America 2.0, bye bye bikini. And I was like, oh, thank you, God, this is what I needed. It just mm -hmm. It was so much joy when I first heard about it because I was like, this is God telling me like, Madison, it's your time. This is your time. And I was like, yes. And so I remember the first one that I signed up for, it was like right after the changes were rolled out. So I was like, okay, I'll put on a swimsuit. Like, it'll be okay. It was hard, but I did it. And then the <laughs> second competition, I was like, oh, I see that swimsuit's still on here. Like, what? why is that? And she's like, oh, the changes haven't been rolled out. So I ended up competing in four competitions that still had lifestyle and fitness and swimsuit. Mm -hmm. And that was really, really hard. Uh, I had still been competing with a lot of girls who carried over from 1.0, who were still very much involved and still loved the Miss America organization as they should. Um, and it was really, really hard because I, I had spent so much time building myself up, but not 
quite understanding how that fit in when you are in direct competition with other women. Mm -hmm. And we, we all like to say that at the end of the day, it's a competition with yourself and it totally is, but we're all human beings and we're all subject to um, some negative self-talk. And I just remember there was one competition that we were practicing. We weren't even in swimsuit, but we were practicing. I felt myself like get really anxious. And I had to say like, her body is great. Your body is also great. They serve different purposes. Just like saying these mantras out loud to myself. And somebody was like, wow, well, she's preaching her platform. And I was like, no, you don't understand. I have to do this. Otherwise, I won't be able to compete. Mm -hmm. So I was very, very happy when I won a title and I didn't have to compete in swimsuit anymore. The next local I went to, everybody was like, oh, swimsuit, it's the end of the era. I was like, hallelujah, let's get this done. Let's get this over with. I'm ready to not compete in swimsuit anymore. That's awesome. And I think women like you are a huge reason as to why Miss America 2.0 is a thing. I know I competed in 1.0 for years and years and years. Um, and swimsuit, I like went back and forth with my feelings about it. And as I got older and like just came farther in my own recovery, I, I learned to love it. But I remember the first time that I stepped out on stage, it was at a rehearsal um, in my bikini. And I was like, why am I doing this? And I just remember, like, I remember the directors of the program had told me I could wear a one piece, but I was like, I'm in, okay, so in my mind, I was like, well, I'm the only fat girl here. I'm not wearing a one piece because that's going to show everyone else that, like, I, I agree with what I thought they were seeing, if that kind of makes sense. And, like, I just remember the first time I walked out in my bikini, I was like, oh my god why am I even here why am I doing this but then as the years went on and as, as I kind of like I, I don't know I ended up learning to love it but now competing without it I'm like oh yes like <laughs> there's not one single phase of competition that I'm literally like fearful don't get me wrong I'm always nervous and like I'm worried I'm gonna fall and I'm worried I'm gonna do all this <laughs> other stuff wrong but like there is no fear and I feel like whether you've had an eating disorder or not any woman can say this like there's no fear like going out in front of hundreds of people in a bikini like you say that to any woman walking along the street like hey do you want to go compete in the swimsuit competition they're gonna be like no. Hell no. Like, no, thank you. Okay. Not. So. Nobody wants to do that, no matter I feel like how comfortable you are with your body or not. I just feel like that, like you, pe girls like you are the reason why Miss America 2.0 is going to thrive because it's just, it's so much more about what you, what you have to say now mm -hmm. and less about how you look in a bikini. And I'm just so, it's so comforting to hear other women say that they like it too, um, because I know when it came out and I was like, Ooh, heck yeah. Um, <laughs> and all of my peers were like really mad that swimsuit was being done with. And I was like, but you have to think about, I mean, this program is so much bigger than an individual. Like you have to think about all the other people it's going to include like women like you that felt like this was some greater force telling them and it was their time to shine. And I mean, you've won two titles since then. So it's just like, I feel like it's doing so much good for the organization. Um, and then do you want to go into talking about your social impact initiative? This is what I'm really excited for. I would love nothing more. So, um, <laughs> kind of weaving this into my story. So this was a couple months before um, Miss uh, America had said, you know, we're getting rid of swimsuits. So this was in about March of two years ago, March of 2018. I was having a really, really bad body day. I was just like, I'm not feeling it. I, I just, I, I know that if I don't take care of myself right now, I'm going to probably relapse. And so what I did was I had created a, a board on Pinterest that had a lot of recovery quotes, recovery affirmations. And so I was scrolling through that and I was just thinking, I said, gosh, I wish that we were teaching this. I wish that we were teaching girls that it's okay to love your body it's okay to gain extra weight when you are going through your teens and 20s. Like, it's okay that your body changes as your life changes. I wish somebody was teaching this. And that's kind of where this idea came from. I said, well, what if instead of treating eating disorders, we started trying to prevent them? And I had this idea. And my first idea was to have this sleepaway camp, clearly years and years and years in the future. 
and just to to teach young girls how to love themselves, to teach themselves to be active without thinking about how many calories they're burning, to teach them how to eat food and to make food that nourishes their body without thinking about how many carbs are in it or how many proteins are in it. And to really like get to the root of what do you love about yourself that isn't physical on your body. So this was just kind of an idea that I had. And um, that day I had like gotten home from work and I had so many thoughts in my head. I just kind of wrote them all down. I came up with the name, the blossom revolution, because I really wanted to convey that this was healthy, that it's okay for your body to change and to blossom means to um, mature or grow in a healthy way, which I thought was such a beautiful analogy, especially for young women. And And then there's, there's a quote that is, um, it's revolutionary to love your body in a world that tells you not to. And I wish I knew who did that quote. I'm so sorry. Credit to whoever made that quote. Um, but and that's kind of how the title came about was it's just so revolutionary to, to grow and mature into the body that you were supposed to have, that you were supposed to be taken care of. Oh, that's so awesome. I love it. Um, and the name of it really has always been so cool to me. Um, and like, the logo and the social media work that you've done with it. I just love, I love everything about it. And I remember when I saw it pop up on my Instagram feed, I was like, Oh, what is this? I had no idea that it it was even like tied to you at the time. It was just like, I came up under the, like who you should follow on Instagram and it was pink and cute and fun. I was like, Oh, I'm going to click that one. Um, and it was so, I fell in love with it from the minute I looked at it. Um, and I love what you've done with everything for it. So going into that, do you want to tell me about your Girl Scout patch? Oh my gosh, yes. So um, I have always wanted to find a way to get into schools and especially to reach young women. Um, and as a title holder, you know, especially now, how hard it is to get into schools. I mean, <laughs> last year we had like snow apocalypse and it was Everybody was pushed back, so you couldn't really get into schools to talk. This mm-hmm. year, there is no school anymore. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and so without even thinking about any of that, I I just really wanted a program where I could implement some of the skills that I was taught during counseling um, and really make that accessible to all girls. And Susan, dear Susan, oh. Susan. Susan Bosch. <laughs> goddess of love and light I was just talking to her about something unrelated and she was like have you ever thought about doing a Girl Scout patch for the Blossom Revolution and I was like yes I thought about it but I have no clue where to start I have no clue who to get in contact with um so yeah I've thought about it but I don't know where to go from here and she has one for um her nonprofit Operation Not Alone shout out to Operation Not Alone <laughs> on Instagram um and she had just sent me all this information and she really like took me step by step and walked me through the process. So I created a program where I teach girls the three pillars of the Blossom Revolution, which is positive self-talk, having a healthy relationship with food and exercise and peer support. We have programs that walk you through that about how to talk um, to yourself positively, how to turn those negative thoughts into positive thoughts, how to assign value to your body that isn't the, the size of it or the shape of it. So my fa- this is one of my favorite activities. We have um, the girls draw a self-portrait, but instead of, you know, drawing themselves as they think they look or they, you know, they're afraid they look, um, you label your body with like, okay, well, I know that I, I give really good hugs and that's what my arms are good for. Like, I oh. love jump roping, so that's what my legs are good for. So just things like that where, again, you take, you take the emphasis off of what you look like, what size you are, and you just go really internal and say, how am I being a better person today? And I'm so excited. I love it so much. I talk about it literally every second that I get the chance. I love that. And I think, I mean, even that last part that you're talking about is labeling the positives about your body with what they do. That's something that, I mean, I was in Girl Scouts. You're young when you're in Girl Scouts. I wish that I had learned those things at a younger age because I think I would have been able to implement them and I could have avoided a lot of the things that I ended up going through later in life because those are things that I'm like just now learning and I'm 23. It's like I came again on Instagram. I'm obsessed. Um, I came across an Instagram post that was like, it was an Instagram influencer. She was posting about a workout, but as I was reading the caption, she was like, I was always made fun of her having big, strong legs and like, it's I they get me from point A to point B they help me you know go up and down flights of stairs I'm an able-bodied woman and my legs get me 
to do so many things. And I just, I took that and I was like, oh my God, like that's such a positive way to look at your body. And I think it's so important that women like you are going out and telling young girls that because I think that alone is just giving young girls an opportunity to love their bodies for so many more years. And I think that that is the coolest thing in the entire world. So I'm so happy for you. I love it. Um, Thank you. It was definitely like a passion project of mine. And I told my directors too, when I was like, Hey, I have this really crazy idea, which is a phrase that they hear from me way too much. It's like, Hey, I have a really crazy idea. And then I just kind of go and do it anyway. But this is going to be, even after I stop competing, the Blossom Revolution is still going to be in full effect. And I just really want to make sure that we get this information out to girls because there are so many barriers to receiving treatment for an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're very much aware of the statistics that, you know, about 1% of people are ever fully cured. 1% Mm -hmm. of people get the treatment that they need to fully recover. And that's just heartbreaking. So instead of treating them where we have so many barriers, let's get to work on preventing them while we can. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And so I guess another question that I have for you is, um, what is something that like you do every day to kind of maintain like a positive and healthy mindset for yourself? Um, That's a great question. Yeah, I definitely try to get enough sleep because I mm-hmm. find that my thoughts just get really anxious, get really spirally when I don't get enough sleep, which sounds really dumb. But I remember reading on Instagram because I'm just like you. I go on there all the time. <laughs> um, reading that sometimes it's better to go to sleep than go to the gym. Like sometimes Mm -hmm. your body doesn't need to go to the gym and be under stress. Sometimes what it needs is rest. Mm -hmm. And I think that was just so revolutionary when I thought about that. So I really make sure that I, I get enough sleep. The way that I think about food now is very different. So I don't think like, oh, this is bad for me. This is good for me. I go off of, well, like, what does my body need? So if I do plan to go to the gym and let's say I'm going to do a leg day workout because I was like, I just really want some strong legs today. I make sure that I prioritize protein and carbs because those are going to be what fuels me through my workout. That's going to help me get those strong muscles. Whereas if I'm, you know, going to be running or even if I'm just going to be running errands, I want to make sure that I prioritize some fats because that's going to be long lasting energy that I'm really going to need. If I, if I need a quick hit of sugar, I'm not afraid to grab some candy. I'm not afraid to grab some like quick carbs because I'm going to need that. That's what my body needs. And I don't need to feel bad for giving my body what it needs. Yes. Say it louder. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Um, And then, my gosh, we've gotten through so much so fast. I love it. Um, I talk so fast. I'm so sorry. No, I do too. I waitress at nights and I'll like tell my tables. I'm like, I talk a mile a minute. So if you need me to say something (laughs) again, just let me know. So I totally know how that is. Um, I guess the last question that I have for you really is that if you don't have an answer, it's okay because it's like out of nowhere. But do you have any like food for thought for the listeners for the podcast? Yes. Um, and I, I heard this, please feel free to bleep this if it's not allowed, but the, the <laughs> fuck it diet is, Ooh, what is that? Oh my gosh. So I follow them on Instagram. It's two dietitians, I believe. And they wrote a book that kind of dispels all of these weight loss rumors, all this diet culture rumors. Um, and they post little yes. tidbits to Instagram that still make me think to this day. The one that's made me think the most is even if we all ate the same things and exercised the exact same way, our bodies would look completely different. Mm-hmm. Stop making your body what it's not supposed to be and start loving it for what it is. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. And I definitely don't want to bleep that out. I love that diet. <laughs> I want to be on that diet. <laughs> right? Like that's, that's exactly what I want it to be. And Literally. It's just, it's just such an incredible way to think about things. I wish, again, that I had learned that much earlier that would have been great and who knows if it would have sunk in but even just having it there having that presence having that be an idea even Mm -hmm. it it I think it would have absolutely changed everything yeah and I mean I've said it once and I'll say it again like it's women like you that are going out here and talking to people about that that are like going to change the future for so many young people I mean like you've said um I wish I would have had 
someone to tell me these things so many years ago because I think it would have changed my entire life path. Um, and so I just so admire people like you that are going out into the communities and doing stuff like that. So well, thank you. I also admire you. You are a huge inspiration for me because uh, for those that don't know our, our deep history, I was the <laughs> choreographer for Miss Wisconsin 2018. And you and Susan and Madeline Winkle and Paige Kastner, those were all such incredible women that I met and got close to that that week. And I just remember being like, they are so strong. They're so powerful. They're so intelligent and they're so pretty. Like, I want to be like them. And I literally signed up for the local, I think, like the next day. Um, so it, it means the world to me that I was able to be a part of this journey with you, that you were able to be a part of this journey with me. We're both going to go out and change the world because that's what needs to happen. We can't keep living like this. We can't keep you know, letting celebrities sell detox teas and diet supplements on Instagram. We can't mm -hmm. do that. We can't let little girls think that they can put their bodies at risk to fit somebody else's ideal. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you have any last words for the Food for Thought listeners? Oh, my gosh. I just had one. And then, of course, it just left my brain. <laughs> um, unfollow anybody that makes you feel bad about yourself. Um, yes. And... And keep looking for the light anytime that you have the slightest idea of feeling guilty and you have that thought that's like, well, why do I feel guilty? Explore that because that is going to be how you change slowly but surely. Anytime that you're like, I want to skip the gym, but I really shouldn't. Or maybe like I'll only do half my workouts day. Explore that because it might seem detrimental right now, but it's those little changes that are going to save you along the way. Yes, so important. All right, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Food for Thought with Madison Augie. I'm your host, Kylie Thompson. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope I left you with some food for thought. See you next week.